We are back into Hebrews chapter 2, and if you were here with us a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, we opened up this chapter with the first four verses, and those first four vo- verses are, are really important for understanding how this entire letter, or as I've contended throughout this series, this sermon works or functions in the, in the life of the church. And it's the beginning of, or the first of, a series of of warnings that the, the author or the preacher of Hebrews is giving to the church. And, and his first warning is maybe the, the most calm or mild warning, but it may have kind of loaded into it the most uh, sense of, of urgency for the people of God. And the warning was just simply this, um, pay very close attention to the message you have heard, lest you drift from it. For how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And so two weeks ago, we talked about that, this tendency in our, in our spiritual lives and um, in the following of Jesus to be a, a people who drift. And, I, and I'll be honest with y'all, I got probably more positive feedback, more folks who reached out to me two weeks ago and said, you know what, I really needed to hear that. I have a, a tendency to drift. I have a, a tendency to kind of get sucked into the vortex of everyday life and neglect my spiritual life and neglect my faith. And so I really needed to be prompted in those ways. But even in receiving that feedback, uh, there was a little bit of a a caution or a danger that I picked up on that I I wanted to press in on some this morning because this is where the rest of chapter 2 will take us. Sometimes when we think of spiritual drifting, we think of that as though it's merely a, a passive posture. We think of drifting as though we're just kind of, you know, the, the, the nautical imagery. We're just a boat sort of floating around in the sea, being tossed around by the wind and the waves. And there were so lots of folks who reached out to me and said, yes, that's been, that's been my problem as of late. I need to kind of plug back in. I need to get it going. I need to, you know, be hard charging for the faith once again. But the author of Hebrews doesn't treat drifting necessarily just like that. Sometimes spiritual drifting, sometimes the the way that we, we distance ourselves from the things of God or from the truth of the message of, of Jesus is not just a, a, a passivity. Sometimes we can do that in a very type A active way. Sometimes we can so overextend our schedules, so overcrowd our lives with just the things that occupy time and space, even good things that, that our lives can be bent towards drifting away from God with very active and sometimes positive endeavors. In fact, as we'll see today in this passage, a passage that's kind of hard to interpret. We're going to have to uh, plumb the depths a little bit this morning. We'll see today that there's a tendency in all of us, I think, to go about life in a very dogged, active way, trying to accomplish great things that actually, if we're not careful, end up in spiritual drift. Let me show you what I mean in chapter 2, beginning down in verse 5 of the book of Hebrews. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to make him like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God 
to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. I've had a week. Y'all know what I mean when I say that? Like, I don't know if, if you do. I've had one of those weeks where it's like, oh, surely it can't get worse. And then it does. I just say I've had a week. That's the way I like to say it. So let me dial back. Last, last Saturday, I loaded my family up and took them to the football competition, tackle football competition, at the University of Oklahoma. And that was bad. We drove, what, seven, eight hours to Oklahoma City. By the time we got there, we wanted to check into our hotel to kind of get squared away before we headed over to the stadium. Our hotel was out of power. So we couldn't check in. One of you know, those little hiccups in life where you're like, oh, great, of course. And we get to the game, and which, by the way, I don't know if y'all been to a football game lately. It's not cheap, especially when you take five people. And sit around for a couple hours while my team gets bludgeoned on the football field and loses. And it was, it was an awful spectacle. And then we have to drive, follow all of the 88,000 people who expose themselves to such a terrible thing. And uh, in, in all their remorse and sadness, we have to drive out in the mass of that traffic. It takes like, you know, an hour and a half to go a mile. We get back to the hotel, we crash, we come back to town. I dropped my car off at the shop before I left and had a few re- repairs that I thought were kind of minor that I needed to get done. And so I go pick my car up at the shop and the bill's hefty and it was more than I thought. But I was like, all right, I had to, the service has to get done. So I, I pay, get my car paid for, get my, my bill paid for. I drive away from the shop, my low fuel light comes on, and I pull up to the gas station, and I go to open up the, I have the little latch that makes your fuel door open up, you know what I'm talking about, and uh, that latch doesn't work. (laughs) And so my fuel door won't open. I thought, well, this is really annoying and frustrating. I just paid a lot of money to fix my car, and now my car's broken, and the one thing my car needs, I can't put in it. So I turn around, it's less than a mile away, I go back to the shop, I was like, hey man, I don't, I don't know if this is anything, you know, I'm not accusing you guys of doing this, but my fuel door just broke. And he's like, oh yeah, leave it with us, give us a little bit longer, we'll fix it. So I'm on foot for another couple of days, go back, pick up my car, and the bill for fixing my fuel door is almost as much as fixing my whole car. And the guy tried to explain to me, like, yeah, basically when they built your car, they put the chassis down, they put the cable that opens your fuel door, and they built the whole car around it. Um, I was like, of course they did. And then, of course, I think, okay, finally, I'll get to watch my team recover from their loss, repair all that was broken last week in their, you know, game system, planning, whatever. And they got beat even worse yesterday. (laughs) And so midway through, I think, the third quarter, I'm out in my front yard trimming my, rage trimming my hedges. (laughs) (laughs) Just like, I got to cut something. Something needs to suffer for my week that I've had. And, I don't, and it hit me, like, at the end of that, and I did a fantastic job on my hedges, by the way. They look, it looks like something from Better Homes and Gardens, my, my backyard. I cleaned my pool. And I stepped back at the end of all that. I kind of gave up on football. You know, I'm, ste- I'm sweaty. I'm, I'm all cut up from the bushes and the branches and everything. And doing the dad pose, hands on the hips, like, look at the good job I'd, I've done. And it hit me, like, why was this the course of action that I chose for a bad week? Have you ever thought, I mean, I don't know if you guys do that when you're frustrated or you're angry. Does anyone else start organizing something? Do you ever start cleaning something? Have you ever thought about why? Because that's what this passage is about. Why is it that whenever we feel like we're helpless or we're out of control, the first thing we do is we grab something that we know we can make that thing do what it is we want it to do? Well, what is that impulse? What is that, that basic human drive that says, okay, I've had a really tough stretch. I don't know really what's going on, but I know that if I do X, Y will happen. And so I'm going to go do that. Well, the author of Hebrews here calls up Psalm 8 and and quotes from from a passage that was really familiar apparently to his Hebrew audiences, people who believed in the Old Testament, believed in the the truth of Yahweh. Uh, And he says, basically, this this one psalm kind of shows us our, our condition. For just a moment, he has made him a little lower than the angels. He's crowned them with glory and honor. And any, you know, well, uh, well-read, understood Hebrew would hear Psalm 8 and go, oh, this is the passage we were taught about how humanity was made in the image of God with, with dignity and with agency and with glory and with honor. And God made all of creation and he set us in the middle of it, in, in the middle of a garden and gave us this this power to enact his purposes in his world for his glory. But the world doesn't always go the way we want it to go. 
It doesn't always respond to our efforts. It doesn't always return in kind with, uh, with the effort and the, the intention that we put into it. And so all of what follows from that quote of Psalm 8, I believe, is the author of Hebrews attempt to tell us. There's a way of drifting that is, that is bent in, into our souls where we go about trying to force the world to be the way we want it to be, and it just won't do what we want it to do. And so instead, we've got to look outside of ourselves to find something that will settle this unsettled soul eternally. Uh, three things I want to show you this morning from Hebrews 5, 2, verses 5 through 18. Uh, the first thing we've got to see is the dilemma that we all face. This, this particular issue that I'm talking about, this, the, a world that won't bow to our will, a truth that we are not God and we don't have sovereign control over all things, the dilemma we all face. And there's the decision that we all must make. In light of that, if the world won't be what you want it to be and do what you want it to do, there's a decision you have to make about how you're going to operate and live within God's world. And finally, the only way we can make that decision is to receive this doctrine that will actually set us free. The truth about Jesus and who he is and what he's done that enables us to live in God's world on God's terms. The dilemma we all face, the decision we must make, and the doctrine that sets us free. First off, here's the dilemma. Look back with me. In verse 5, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. So again, if you haven't been with us, here the author of Hebrews is basically doing a call back to everything he's written or preached thus far. Uh, the beginning of this, we're told that Jesus is superior over all things. All of creation bows to him. Jesus is the one who's the exact imprint of God's nature. He's the representation of God's character. And then in comparison, the author goes into at the end of, of chapter 1 saying, the angels, though there are angelic beings charged with divine glory, those angels uh, don't occupy the same space or authority that Jesus does. And so the recall here is essentially, he's essentially saying it was not angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. And here it is, Psalm 8, verse 6. It has been testified elsewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? or the son of man, that you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Well, what's going on here? A lot of scholars, a lot of people who studied the New Testament for a living have spilled a lot of ink trying to understand exactly what is happening when the author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 8 and then starts talking about Jesus. And it's almost kind of understood that there's a double meaning. There's, a, there's two, two understandings, two interpretations, both of which are two, playing out, true, playing out in what the author here is saying. The first one is simply that whenever the author is calling up Psalm 8, he's talking about this, the situation of humanity. We were made a little lower than the angels. We were set apart in God's creation with glory and with honor, with dignity and with agency to, to cause the creation that God had set us in to bring forth the fruit that he intended. But we don't see that working out this way. Why? Because we live in a post-Genesis 3 world. A world where Adam and Eve sinned, where the curse of humanity has befallen all of us, where the world does not bring forth what it was supposed to bring forth. Instead, brings forth frustration, as God told Adam when the curse was handed down. Look, you're going to toil and labor in the fields, but it's not going to produce the fruit that it was originally intended to produce. The sweat of your brow will not bring forth what you had intended. In other words, we have glory and we have agency, but we don't have sovereignty. We have glory and we have agency, but we are not sovereign. We are not gods over creation. We don't see the world into sub in subjection to Jesus, even the way that it currently is. That's what the author says. We, we don't see the world working under our control the way that God had intended. And so we find ourselves in this peculiar spot of like, we understand that we have agency, we have honor, we have dignity, we have glory, but we can't make the world bow to our will. That brings about some measure of frustration. It brings about some measure of, uh, of fear or some measure of anger. It brings about some sense of emptiness. What are we actually doing here? How do we accomplish the task that has been set before us if the world won't do what we want it to do? 
I've been in a course of study for uh, about a month now that I've kind of chosen a little path I've chosen to go down. It's got some required reading to it. And uh, most of it's, you know, in the psychology world. And I stumbled across two different articles this week that I had to read for this particular course of study, both of which were tapping into this very human dilemma and how often it plays out in our hearts and lives. The first one comes from a medical journal a guy wrote back in the 70s, a guy named Tom Fogarty, a medical doctor, about how people basically experience emptiness in all of life. And I thought that this captured perfectly what the author of Hebrews is talking about in our frustration of not seeing the world bow to our will. He says, to some extent, all people, some more than others, avoid emptiness by the self-deception of filling in and replacement. The emptiness inside of self and between self and others is vaguely sensed and acknowledged. Solutions are sought by filling it in with something for something familiar or similar or in other activities and places rather than exposing oneself to it directly. Real quick, what he's saying here is we all have this sense that the world won't do what we want it to do and it makes us feel empty. And so we try to find something that will fill that void. Here's what he says. A lonely wife may feel emptiness by getting over involved with the children. A lonely husband by over involvement with work. One can try to fill the emptiness with such things as drink and food or books and television. Overinvested causes such as missionary endeavors and political issues and social injustice may represent, in part, attempts to fill personal emptiness. Still others try to avoid facing this state, feeling this state, by getting involved in furious activity, increasing the rhythm of their life, organizing and filling their schedule so there's no time to think and introspect. Periodically, they become exhausted and retreat to vacations or any change of pace, only to eventually return to their furious schedule. That's the dilemma we face. That's the this, this state of being made a little lower than the angels and having the world that was created to be under our rule and under our, our, our sovereignty. But we don't have sovereignty because of sin and because of our own brokenness and because of our own rejection and rebellion. We find ourselves empty inside because the world won't do what we want it to do. So we have a week. We grab the hedge trimmers and we go out and we thrash about and hoping that somehow we can exercise some measure of control in our small little world and get our arms once again around this idea that maybe I am a, just a little bit like God. If I can make the hedges look how I want them to look, if I, can, if I can organize the garage, if I can organize the Tupperware drawer, whatever the thing is, I'll feel, if only for a second, like I have some measure of sovereignty over this creation. And what the author of Hebrews says is if we don't see that, if we don't check that, if we don't correct that, if we don't, if we don't acknowledge this dilemma, it, it, it lists us into a, a life of slavery. I don't know if you caught it towards the end of this where he, he says what Jesus is doing for, for us. Down in verse 14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver, here it is, all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. If we don't see what's in front of us, if we don't see that death is coming, if we don't acknowledge that, if we don't realize that we are not God and we don't have control over our lives, then we will eventually just decide to live in slavery. Fear of death locks us into a life of perpetual slavery. If we can't see that if we don't have the control that we want and we long for and we lust for, if we can't see that the world won't bend to our will, if we can't see that we're not going to be the gods that we want to be, we will wind up living our entire lives, whether acknowledged or not, with some semblance of a fear of death that makes our life look a lot like slavery. Again, I told you I read two articles this week that talked about this from, from a psychological perspective, and both of them were spot on. The other one came about as reading, I was reading an article on burnout and how we, we enlist ourselves to try to fill this void of emptiness, and then we end up feeling kind of dead inside. This is how the author writes this. She writes, his energy level is depleting. He feels chronically fatigued. He pushes himself harder, but starts to have trouble sleeping. He wakes up exhausted, starts to become irritable and impatient. Boredom and detachment set in. Skepticism and cynicism creep into his life. But then the old omnipotent sneaks in. No one else can do it. Only I can. Then he begins to feel underappreciated and mistreated and increasingly suspicious of his environment and the people around him, even his family. No one understands. Later, he feels disoriented. His memory starts to go. He's not the clear thinker he once was. His span of concentration decreases. Eventually, he may become depressed and develop physical symptoms. 
Then he becomes divorced from many of his feelings. This detachment has a way of intensifying into the more serious D's, disengagement, distancing, dulling, and deadness. If we don't check what's happening in our hearts and lives, we don't see that there's a lack of control in the cosmos that we, we don't have that, that aches and pains in our own souls and then leads us to fear death such that we get enslaved, we wind up just burning out and flaming out. So what's the cure for that? I don't know if any of y'all, when you hear that list of things about what it could feel like to feel burned out, say, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. I've seen my own attempts at being my own Lord and Savior come to a, a deadening end, this place of dullness and emptiness that I don't have any control over. And I've seen how then I launch into all these other furious activities and fill my schedule so that I can feel like God even for just a second. What do you do with that? Well, I think the author of Hebrews here says this is a decision that you must make. There's a decision that you must make. And, and throughout the centuries, this has been the human predicament and problem. What are we going to do with our, with our limitations? What are we going to do with the stuff that we don't understand or we can't control? Uh, I'm reading a book right now. by um, One of my things I like to study is how to initiate men in, or young boys into, into manhood because i got a son that's going to be 13 in a couple years. And I'm like, okay, how do I prepare him to kind of walk in and, 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 and live into a, a life of fullness as, as a man? And, for centuries, uh, every, basically every culture on the planet has asked that question. How do we initiate boys into men? And so I've been reading a lot about that. And I've read this one guy who did a big, heavy study on that. What has all of the cultures throughout history done to try to initiate boys into men? And it was shocking to me what he said was the, the five things that they all kind of had in common, despite culture, time, and history, or anything. The five things that, that the truths that, that men have tried to teach their sons so that they prepare for manhood. Here's what they are. Life is hard. You are not that important. Your life is not about you. You are not in control and you are going to die. <laughs> I, was like, I don't know if I want to teach my kid that. That sounds really depressing. But he said, look, I've looked at this for 2,000 plus years, cultures all over the planet, written history. Men have been trying to initiate their sons into manhood. And these are the five things that have shown up in all of them. You, you need to realize life is hard. You're not that important. Your life is not about you. You're not in control, and you are going to die. Now, that's one way to deal with our dilemma. I think it would be actually a positive step because so much of what, of what leads us to this place of emptiness, this place of burnout, this place of not realizing that the world won't bow to us is a lack of acknowledging those basic truths. Not that important. I'm not in control. Life is going to be hard. I'm going to die. That's one way to fight off the fear of death that leads to slavery. But the author of Hebrews has something that's even better and even richer. This, the decision that we have to make is a decision to see something outside of ourselves, namely someone who actually can save us, who actually can deliver us. Look back again. Look back at, at, at verse at Verse 9. I'm sorry, go back to verse 8. The end of verse 8 is the, the end of, of, of the, the quote of Psalm 8. And he says this, Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. Now this is that double meaning. The him here could be humanity and the him here could be Jesus. And I think it means both. So the author of Hebrews is saying, In putting everything in subjection to him, that is Adam and humanity, he left nothing outside of his control. But also... The same extends to Jesus, and that's where he takes it next. But, but in putting everything in, in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. This is a really big, important point. At this moment, you do not see the world operating in complete and total subjection to King Jesus. You don't see it operating in control yourself either. But here's what he says. We see him. Who? For a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. We don't see the world in subjection to him, but we see him. That is, if we look outside of ourselves to the one who tasted death on our behalf, we have no need for fear of death. We have to make a decision here. Are you going to see the Messiah? 
Are you going to look to the Lord? Are you going to try to be your own Messiah? Are you going to try to be the Messiah of the world? Who by force of effort, force of will, gifts, talents, abilities, whatever, you're going to force the world to bend to your will. Are you going to try to be your own Messiah? Or are you going to look outside of yourself? We do not see the world subjected to him, but we see him. Who for just a moment condescended, became man, took on flesh, just like us. So that the world could be brought under his feet. In order to do what? To taste death for all of us. The author of Hebrews here points to the fact that Jesus has suffered on our behalf and he's done so by the grace of God. Unmerited favor from God is why we can look outside of ourselves and see him, the Messiah, suffering in our stead, becoming for us what we could not be for ourselves. Look at verse 10. For it was hit fitting that he, that is Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. That in the suffering of Jesus, we look outside of ourselves. We see, yeah, I had a week. Jesus had a life. From the beginning, he was bent on doing the will of God, and it cost him everything. He laid down his life. Why? To bring many sons and daughters to glory. So that the the stuff that God made us for could be actualized in our life. We could actually experience glory and agency and dignity in in and through the person of Jesus. But the decision we have to make is not just see the Messiah, but we have to see that we're only going to be sanctified through suffering. When you have a week, when you have a month, when you have a stretch of years like most of us have, that, that you have to learn to see in those moments, actively choose to see that these trials and these challenges are, are God's way of sanctifying us, of, of, of cleaning us up, shaping us, and form, forming us into the image and likeness of Jesus, if we will but surrender to them in faith. That, that's what the author says in verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. If God has taken Jesus through all these trials for my salvation, then he's taken me through stuff as well in order to make me more like him. That's why the only way we'll make that decision is if we lay hold of the doctrine that will ultimately set us free. The truth that is etched into this this passage that will enable us to say, you know what, I don't have to be the sovereign Lord of all things. I'm not. I don't have to try to be my own Savior and Lord. I can't be my own master. The world will not bend to my will. But Jesus has laid down his life to enable me to be able to be sanctified through suffering just as he was. What is the doctrine that sets us free? Well, first off, it's that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. Over and over and over again, the author of Hebrews here talks about Jesus calling us brothers. In fact, he quotes from uh, three, maybe four different passages in the Old Testament. And it's fascinating the way the author of Hebrews splices these verses together that have nothing to do really with the subject at hand. But he says, oh, there's a place in Psalms. There's a place in Isaiah. There's another place in Psalms. There's another place in Isaiah where we're told that we're brothers through, through this likeness and kinship with Jesus. He quotes him there in verse 12. I will tell of, you, of, of your name to my brothers and in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, verse 13, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. He says, there's these places that that you guys know about in the Old Testament, and all that's about God being willing to make us family. And we can trust Jesus. If he's not ashamed to call us family, then then, then he's not ashamed whenever we suffer. He's not ashamed when the world doesn't do what we want. He's there with us, and he loves us, and he's for us. Our faithful big brother has paved the way for our salvation. We don't run from him. We run to him. That's why verse 14 is so important. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And then keep reading. Look with me. Verse 15. Here it is. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that help that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. And in verse 17, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. What's the second thing we've got to learn to be set free? Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest. 
pretty much the rest of the book of Hebrews is going to be unpacking that theme. So we won't spend a ton of time on it today because the word high priest may not mean anything to you. And we'll kind of unpack a lot of that later on. But the job of the high priest is to make it atonement for and intercession for God's people. The high priest stands at this thin space between heaven and earth in the presence of God in the Old Testament on behalf of the people to intercede for them, to make atonement for their sins, to make sure that the way is clear for God and man to be rejoined and reconciled. And the author of Hebrews here says that Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest. That is, in his mercy, his His decision to be for us is because he's merciful, and he continues to do so. He'll be faithful until the end. And then he uses a big word. There at the end of of verse uh, uh, 17, he says that he became a faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That is to, to serve as the atoning sacrifice so that we would not have to fear the wrath of God. It's as if our sin was laid on Jesus. It's as if Jesus' righteousness is placed upon us. He stands in that gap in our space so that we don't have to feel like we're going to be smited by God at any second. That's why all of this wraps up the way that it wraps up in verse 18. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus comes to our rescue when we're tempted. When we're tempted to throw our hands up because the world doesn't operate the way that we think that it should, or because it looks like our enemies are winning, or because the frustrations of everyday life feel like they're going to take us under. Jesus comes to our rescue when we're tempted to believe that our suffering is because God is against us, not because God is sanctifying us. Jesus comes to our rescue and he calls us family. He comes to our rescue and he intercedes on our behalf. He goes before the very throne of God and makes prayers and intercession for us so that we can make it. Jesus Jesus comes to our rescue when we're tempted because he's going to be faithful. He'll be faithful to the end. He'll always keep his word. Do you need to be set free this morning from the slavery that is caused from fear of death? Do you need to be released from this mission that you're on to try to prove yourself, your worth, your very existence? If so, you can be released today. Your suffering is God's sanctifying grace in your life. Jesus beckons you to come to him and be found in him. Father, would you incline our hearts in that direction this morning? Even now as we come to your table, would we be able to taste, quite literally, that it is because of of your suffering that we can be made whole? It is because of your life, your death, and your resurrection, Jesus, that we can be renewed. And when we lay all of our deadly doing down, all the ways we try to justify ourselves, all the ways that we try to cover up our own emptiness, all the ways that we're burned out and frustrated because life hasn't gone the way that we thought that it should. And today, by faith, would you renew us? Would you enliven our hopes and our affections? Would our ambitions be for the things of your kingdom? And would our hearts be settled and assured in the light of your grace. And I ask these things in your name. Amen.